So welcome, thank you for joining us. It's Friday 31st of July 2020 and we're about to participate in a panel discussion, um, COVID-19 risk assessment for wind instrumentalists. This is going to be pre presented by Dr. Adam Schwalche and there's going to be four medical infectious disease and aerosol experts who will discuss and answer questions about the risk of COVID-19 applied to wind instrument playing. Um, Dr. Adam Schwache is a resident physician and National Institutes of Health, T32 Research Fellow in the Department of Autologerie, you can say that better than me, Adam, no. at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, UIHC. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass you straight on. All right, perfect. So uh, thank you very much and, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, IDRS, Eric Stomberg, um, Kara Wolf, the whole team who has uh, uh, put this together. Um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to introduce the panelists um, uh, shortly. But first, I did want to start off uh, with a bit of a presentation. So I will uh, share my screen here. Um, Perfect. Can you all see the screen then? Great. So um, uh, this is uh, just a brief overview that I wanted to share with everyone uh, so that we're all kind of on the same page as we start uh, discussing these issues in more detail. Um, there we go. And so I wanted to start off with the idea that COVID-19 is indeed a serious disease. And this chart is uh, uh, one that I got just yesterday from Johns Hopkins. It displays the deaths from COVID-19 in the United States uh, specifically. And you can see that the trend is, uh, continues to increase. Um, we're approaching in the US, uh, we're approaching one in 2000 Americans dead from COVID-19. Um, this is a serious problem. There's questions about how COVID-19 can spread. Um, most attention has been focused on the droplet route, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk much more about, and also the aerosol route. Uh, aerosols um, are kind of small droplets. They're on a continuum with droplets. Aerosols can suspend in the air, move with air currents, uh, don't require you to touch things, you can breathe them in. Um, and uh, in oh, a few weeks ago, uh, 239 authors wrote a letter to the World Health Organization suggesting that aerosol spread should be investigated more. Um, and so some of the reasons for that are that there's data that suggests that this disease spreads through aerosols. And so this is data uh, from a Chinese restaurant. There are other pieces of, of data that uh, uh, support this. And some of you might be familiar with um, events in Washington uh, state with um, uh, choir practices around the world in Amsterdam and other places, choir practices uh, that also might, be, might have been associated with uh, wide aerosol spread of this disease. This particular data from a Chinese restaurant uh, shows, you can see on the bottom panel, uh, that the individual that was circled and is in yellow is thought to be the index case. Uh, the other individuals that are circled were infected. The ones that are not circled were not. And there's really not too many other ways to interpret this data other than the idea that the ventilation system was spreading uh, this disease. Now, how are aerosols produced? So aerosols can be produced by breathing. They can be produced by speaking. And as we're learning more and more, they can also be produced by playing wind instruments, singing, playing brass. Um, 
there's a, a very nice study in 2019 by uh, Asadi and others. And I wanted to highlight to you uh, in this slide, uh, just the idea that louder speech produces more aerosols. And so you can see on the right side of both of these graphs is loud speech. Uh, you can see that the number of aerosols produced is higher than with any of these other uh, uh, modes of production. So that sort of gave us some of the beginnings of an idea that, well, if speech is a problem, then uh, singing uh, uh, may also be a problem. And if singing is a problem, wind instruments uh, and brass instruments might also be a problem. So this has been studied at uh, at least four, now probably five or six study uh, uh, centers in the United States. Um, and uh, University of Colorado at Boulder was uh, one of the first to release any of their results. Uh, they released preliminary results um, a couple of weeks ago uh, from one week of testing. And I wanted to highlight here the disclaimer that they included in their preliminary results. And so they say that this is from one week of testing. The results will be further defined. Um, they say that uh, um, they don't use live virus or infected participants for obvious reasons. And so it's difficult to generalize for that reason. Um, and then they go on to say, not in this uh, uh, particular slide, but in other slides, that um, uh, these, these data didn't go through sort of the normal scientific uh, way of presenting data, which would be peer review. Um, you know, th these are very, very raw preliminary data. They tested four uh, instrumentalists and one singer, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So these are their preliminary results from a soprano singer that they have released at the website that's on the bottom of your screen here. And I wanted to draw your attention to the range at the left side of the screen. So this is their concentration that they measured, and the range is from zero to 80. And the most sort of in, intense amount of aerosol production by the singer was right around here, just over 70 uh, per cubic centimeter. Um, if you compare that with their results from a clarinet player, uh, the range over here is uh, zero to 900. And you can see that there are some instances where the clarinet player uh, in this case is producing significantly more numbers of uh, aerosol droplets uh, or of aerosols than the singer did. Um, it's hard to know exactly what that means from an infectious risk, but it does seem that more aerosols is probably worse than fewer aerosols. Uh, Cincinnati um, uh, just came out with preliminary results earlier this week. Uh, I don't have any uh, pictures of their slides because they haven't released those slides yet. But uh, just overall, I wanted to highlight that uh, they tested two mezzo-sopranos and then seven wind instrumentalists, all playing different wind instruments. Uh, their test was, was the, the methodology was very different from the test uh, at Boulder. So in Cincinnati, they were using real spaces, real practice rooms. Um, as opposed to in Boulder, they used a clean room to do the, um, uh, the testing. In Cincinnati, they had 10 minute sessions in these spaces. And they found some things that are a little different from what the folks in Boulder found. So they found that singing produced more aerosols than playing. Uh, but both activities produced uh, aerosols. And they also found that uh, HEPA filtration, uh, individual HEPA filters might be uh, useful. I wanted to bring up uh, uh, something else that has come up now um, just uh, uh, last night from a Minnesota study uh, that is a preliminary uh, uh, article is, is relieved, released on the Med Archive site. Uh, and they talk about super emitters in that uh, paper. And this uh, uh, chart is the same one that you saw back from 2019, but I wanted to highlight here these red pluses that you see up at the top of the uh, charts uh, on, uh, on both sides here. Uh, these people are producing double or more the number of aerosols that other people were producing in this study. And so we think that there are some people 
who just produce more aerosols. And those people are called super emitters, and they might be associated with the type of um, uh, uh, super spreading events that can spread disease uh, um, quickly. And so I, I wanted to give a bit of a disclaimer as well for this uh, uh, discussion. And the most common questions that we got uh, and there were several hundred questions that, that people have already submitted and I wanna thank everybody for doing that. The most common questions that, that we got were um, about people's particular circumstance. Um, for example, how can I be safe uh, when I'm practicing uh, uh, or when I'm teaching in my studio? And those questions are really difficult to answer. And I think that we can talk uh, in generalities here um, and we can give some sort of basic advice about how one might proceed with figuring out whether things are safe or not safe or what to do or not do. Um, but in order to figure out your particular situation, um, you, you really, uh, should consider talking with your, your building engineers, your facilities management, the administration, infectious disease experts in your area that can think about the prevalence of disease in your area, the ability to test people. There's a lot of uh, variability in even just in ventilation systems that can really have a huge impact on your particular risks for your situation. And so I'd like to uh, uh, start with uh, introducing uh, our panelists. And first is Dr. Peter Chin Hong. Um, PCH is uh, uh, what we call him in med school. And, uh, but uh, Dr. Chin Hong is uh, uh, the Associate Dean for Regional Campuses uh, at University of California, San Francisco. Um, he got his MD from Brown University, Internal Medicine Residency and Infectious Disease Fellowship uh, at University of California, San Francisco, uh, was the holder of the Academy of Medical Educators Endowed Chair for Innovation and in Teaching. Um, he is uh, also continues clinical work and educating, uh, a wonderful uh, educator, teacher, mentor, uh, most importantly, commencement speaker from my class, uh, and uh, is currently working uh, with the San, uh, San Francisco Opera and so has some very um, interesting ideas on uh, application uh, of all of these thoughts to real life music making in, in, uh, in real situations. Um, Dr. Uh, Harry Hoffman is uh, a professor of otolaryngology at University of Iowa, uh, where I am currently. Uh, he graduated from University of California, San Diego, uh, for his medical degree and did his residency at University of Iowa, has done fellowships in head and neck surgery and facial plastic surgery. Uh, he's director of our voice clinic. Uh, he does a lot of research into laryngeal pathophysiology. Um, if you have seen uh, the article uh, uh, that, that I co-authored with him on the Iowa protocols, he has developed the Iowa protocols website, which is a tremendous resource uh, for otolaryngologists and others, um, and uh, he plays a mean guitar as well. And uh, I've played some jazz bassoon with him, um, uh, which was terrifying. Uh, Dr. Vulcans uh, is a professor of mechanical engineering and director of the Center for Energy Development and Health at Colorado State University. Um, he uh, has degrees in civil engineering from University of Vermont, PhD in environmental engineering from School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, <clears throat> postdoc at the uh, Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S., uh, 2018 finalist for the NASA Earth, Space, and Air Prize, uh, and uh, also uh, running one of the very important studies into this very issue on uh, wind, brass, and singing aerosol production uh, at Colorado State University currently, and I'm sure we'll get to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and so with that, I want to welcome uh, all of the panelists, and thank you so much for, uh, for coming and for, for joining us. Um, and, and I really wanted to start off um, with this question of aerosols. And, and Dr. Vulcans, I, I wonder if, if you might start by giving us uh, some idea of what are aerosols and why should we care about them? Sure, Adam, thanks so much. 
Uh, so the definition of an aerosol is pretty simple. It just means a, a particle suspended in a gas. And of course, for us, that gas is air. And by suspended in the gas, we mean that it has a lifetime uh, more than you know, a few seconds, right? So raindrops we don't think are aerosols, even though we call them drops. Um, droplet is a word that just means a small drop. And a droplet is an aerosol. So when we talk about droplets and aerosols, we're really talking about the same thing. In our field, we typically say that aerosols can be as small as just a few nanometers. Below that point, they become gas molecules. Uh, and they go all the way up to about 100 microns in diameter. Um, the thickness of your hair, depending on your genetics, is about 50 microns. Uh, the thickness of a grain of flour is about 100 microns. The, the dot on an eye in a newspaper is about 400 microns. So that gives you an idea of size. Um, but when we talk about aerosols, we typically talk about something you know, between, oh, 10 nanometers and 100 micrometers, a nanometer being 1,000 of, uh, of a micron. What I need to impress here, of course, is that aerosols span almost five orders of magnitude in size in, in the air. When we talk about COVID, um, the COVID virion is about 120 nanometers in diameter or 0.12 microns. And so anything smaller than that isn't gonna contain a full intact virion. And we worry about things that go all the way up to you know, several hundred microns in size that could be generated from a cough or a sneeze. Thanks, thanks so much. And Dr. Hoffman, I know you've done uh, a lot of work on, on controlling aerosols in the hospital setting. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and how easy or hard is it to, uh, to control these aerosols um, uh, in, in clinics, for example? I think the word uh, mitigation is important in that you're not going to control them entirely unless you separate people physically, even outside of a building to a different building, such as we're doing uh, here currently. Uh, the mitigation process really has a lot to do with considering the concept of infective inoculum. And so what you want to do is decrease that as much as possible by a ver variety of different barriers and perhaps uh, negative pressure. Uh, Dr. Chin Hung, do, do we do we have an idea of what the infective uh, uh, inoculum or infective dose is for for COVID nineteen at this point? Um, thanks, Adam. So we we don't really have a great idea for the inoc the minimum inoculum dose, but we do have some extrapolation from um, you know other concepts of infectious disease. First of all, I guess for framing uh, to extend Dr. Vulcan's um, great explanation into a disease concept. Uh, not all aerosols are uh, created equal or not all droplets are created equal. So there's a spectrum. So on one end, as an infectious disease doctor, I think about uh, measles and tuberculosis. And then there is, you know, various shades of uh, influenza than uh, COVID. So, you know, when we're using that term, aerosol or aerosolization or airborne in terms of an infectious disease doctor, I think about airborne. To me, uh, one person with measles can have a far more impact on causing other people to get measles than say COVID in general. And like uh, Dr. Hoffman says, you know, the way we think about it is not in prevention of all risk, but in terms of mitigation of risk. So we try to make you as safe as possible, but we can't guarantee that there's no possible way that you can't get it. So it's just like when I give you a cholesterol medicine for prevention of heart attack, I give you a medicine to prevent your risk substantially, but it doesn't say that you're never gonna get a heart attack. So that's the framing of which we think about. So, um, so that's how I think about it in terms of a infectious disease spectrum. So I don't think about it as scary as measles or tuberculosis because those words can be used in different ways. Um, yeah, not all as strictly as Dr. Vulcan say, when people use it in common talk. So uh, that's the spectrum from infectious disease perspective. So the masks uh, make a difference in terms of that. So for measles and, and tuberculosis, we need to use the N95 mask in the hospital. For regular respiratory droplet spread infections, influenza, uh, adenovirus, other kinds of things, we generally can just use a surgical mask 
with eye protection. Of course, there's a spectrum with COVID. So that's why in certain situations, for example, in wind instruments, we'd worry a little bit more because of giving those droplets superpowers. But it starts off as a droplet. It doesn't start off as an airborne like measles or tuberculosis. So that's kind of the framing I wanted to start off with. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so, and so, if we do move on to sort of ways that we can think about mitigating, and I think that's the, the question that everybody has about this. And so, there's this idea of six feet. Uh, what, what, where does six feet come from? What, what's that all about? I can start off with it, and others can amplify. So basically, the way I think about it is because it's mainly droplets. So the way I think about it in terms of personification is that COVID nineteen is SARS-CoV-2 is kind of a lazy virus, so it's just like hanging out on this droplet and it doesn't really want to do much. It doesn't want to fly around like measles or tuberculosis like a dandelion. So that droplet, which is lying on, uh, is kind of heavy. So it's going to fall generally, again, not taking the whole spectrum of eventualities within three feet because it's kind of heavy. So when you say six feet, you give a three feet buffer and that's what the public health recommendations are based on, but again, in this group, we're talking about the nuances based on different situations, but that's a recognition for the general public. So Dr. Wilkins, what, what is your, what's your take on the, the six foot distance and uh, can it be applicable if uh, in fact aerosols are a problem? Yeah, the six foot dis distance as um, Peter indicates is predicated on this large droplet mode of transmission um, everyone has been in a room with a close talker and felt a little bit of spit on their face when they're talking to someone. And everyone has been sneezed on uh, by someone at some point, especially if you have children. Uh, at six feet, it's hard for one of those um, spitter talkers to, to spit on you. And uh, at six feet, it's hard for a sneeze relative to its immediate uh, jet to impact you. And the thinking, the, the predominant thinking um, by, the, uh, by bodies like the World Health Organization is that those are the main modes of transmission through air for a respiratory virus. Those modes of transmission do not pay any heed to an aerosol mode of transmission. Um, and that's a problem uh, in my opinion because I do think while it may not be uh, you know, as, as bad as getting sneezed on <laughs> at short distance, it's likely that um, aerosol mode does play a role in transmission of COVID uh, because large droplets don't stay large droplets in air for very long. And that's because most of what comes out of your body is made of water. And that water evaporates very quickly. What doesn't evaporate or go away, of course, is what's ever left in the droplet, like the salt uh, in your spit or some protein, or unfortunately, potentially a COVID virion. So let me give you an example, a 50 micron particle. If I were to drop that out of my hand, it would, it would drop at almost six or seven centimeters per second. And so it'd be hard to imagine that, uh, you know, a particle like that could go very far in a room because it would fall out of the air. But a 50 micron droplet will evaporate in about one to two seconds and turn into about a 10 micron particle. A 10 micron particle has a much larger reach in a room because it only settles at less than a centimeter per second through air, which means that it can travel farther, it persists for longer, and potentially can be, can be inhaled into the respiratory system. So the six foot rule is predicated on, on uh, I would say, in my opinion, an, an older way of thinking that we probably need to adjust. It's still a good recommendation, but it's probably not foolproof from a risk mitigation standpoint as both Henry and Peter have uh, referred to before. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Vulcan, so um, one of the ideas that comes up fairly frequently in wind instrumentalist uh, groups is that what if these aerosols that you're measuring are just condensation? We all think that as we blow warm air through our cold instruments, we create, uh, uh, you know, water from just from condensation. Is there any way that uh, uh, that just condensation particles are are what is uh, causing uh, this perceived issue from wind instrumentalists? Um, 
Based on my understanding of thermodynamics, I think that of course condensation is possible within a wind instrument, but I think it's highly unlikely that that is the sole mode that could be generating aerosols. And this is uh, from my discussions with performers who, who are, participate in our study, um, you know, they indicate that a lot of spit and saliva builds up in an instrument over time. And um, it's more likely that you are depositing saliva into the instrument that is getting carried through the instrument because you're forcing air through it and then being re-aerosolized at some point, either through forced air or through vibration. Um, a, you know, and, and let me say that um, we have good evidence that singing produces aerosol, right? And so what are you doing when you sing? You're vibrating your vocal cords. Yeah. And Dr. Hoffman, can you help us understand, uh, uh, and I know that we've looked at some of these videos together, but how does singing look like instrument playing uh, uh, as, as you, you know, look with a camera through someone's nose into the throat? Hey, so um, Adam and I did some studies last year that were really terrific, would be really hard to reproduce now in the COVID era, where we'd have a flexible scope through one nostril, looking at the larynx and a flexible scoop through the other nostril, looking at the palate as a flute player was doing some circular breathing and other maneuvers, also uh, studied um, a bassoon and other instruments and identified the playing of an instrument like that looks all the world like a singer performing. You see the uh, vocal folds uh, opening and closing and thinning and lengthening in the pharynx, uh, changing its shape as the sounds are coming out. It was really exciting for, for me as a laryngologist to identify that maybe I don't need to just limit my work on the larynx to singers, but also to wind instrumentalists because what they're doing looks all the world like singing as they're producing the, uh, the airflow to go through their instrument. Um, Dr. Chin Hong, would you rather be in a, uh, in a small space uh, for a long time with someone or in a big space for a short time? Definitely in a big space for a short time mm -hmm. and outdoors rather than indoors. So I think what uh, Adam is getting to is beginning to think about some of the ways in which we can mitigate risk. So not all space and not all physical space is created equal. Um, and, you know, certainly if you think about it from a physical perspective. When you're outdoors, you have currents, they're disrupting the laminar flow that can happen when somebody speaks or sings or plays an instrument directly at you. And the more turbulence you can get, the more disruptions there are. That's why, you know, in public health recommendations, people say, you know, if you're drive, driving in a car, you know, crack the window a little bit. If you're in a bus and you have to take public transportation, you know, try to see if the window's open that's why airlines might be a little bit more uh, problematic, uh, even though there's HEPA filtration. So these are, that's the concept. Thank you. Yeah. And Dr. Volkins, is it possible to quantify the amount of risk reduction that you might get from being outside versus uh, inside, for example? Well, I think um, it's possible to estimate the, the risk reduction. And that work is being done actually at the University of Maryland, uh, which is a companion study to the one being run at, at Boulder. Uh, and, and here at CSU. Uh, so they're going to be modeling uh, how particles that are released from the body uh, move through environments, both indoors and outdoors. And so with those sorts of models, you can look at how particles move through air and you can think about, um, you know, sep you, can, you can play scenarios where you separate people out, put them at differences, give different wind conditions, and look at the potential for an aerosol coming out of one person or a droplet to reach another person. But just speaking anecdotally, being outdoors is a massive risk reduction than being indoors because you're no longer in a confined space. And everyone can think about this from their own personal experience. If you're old enough to have ever been in a room indoors with a smoker, you know that you can't avoid the smoke coming out. That's an aerosol, right? That persists. You can't avoid the smoke indoors that coming out of a smoker for, you know, after a minute or two because it's everywhere in the room. However, when you're outdoors and a smoker is nearby, you really just have to not be downwind of them. And usually that smoke dissipates very rapidly. So from that simple experiment that, that we've all seen, you can understand how 
the dispersion and uh, the dilution of aerosol coming out of our bodies happens much more faster and effectively outdoors, which means, of course, that exposure rates go down outdoors significantly. And what sort of indoor parameters can we think about uh, when we're kind of assessing how risky things might be indoors, or alternatively, how can we make indoors more like the outdoors? Yeah. Uh, you need to increase the air exchange rate or the clean air delivery rate to that room. Those are slightly different things. The air exchange rate just means how often air circulates through a room. But if I have uh, uh, an HVAC system that is just circulating air through a room in a circle, well, I'm not removing any potential viral load in that room unless I have a very effective filter. Most HVAC systems indoors actually only bring in about 10 or 20% clean air per path, per circulation, which is not a lot of clean air delivery. Unless they, of course, they have a very effective filter and most HVAC systems do not have very effective filters unless you're in a hospital or laboratory setting. So you, so, Really, you need to increase the rate of clean air coming into the room, outdoor air. Opening up the windows is a great, uh, you know, in my opinion, is, is better than turning the HVAC system on full blast because most HVAC systems are not going to be able to keep up with that sort of um, ventilation rate. It, it can help. Um, and most HVAC systems cannot handle high efficiency filters because they were not designed to operate with high efficiency filters. It's like going running and trying to breathe through a straw, right? You can't get a high ventilation rate through your body when you breathe through a straw because it is hard to breathe through. What makes a filter effective is that it's hard for air to pass through it. And so when you put a very uh, effective filter in a ventilation system, you usually choke down that ventilation flow because the fan powering that system was not designed to pull against a filter like that, just like a runner isn't designed to breathe through a straw. Yeah. And so, so there's a bunch of things that are, that are discussed fairly commonly now on, on uh, uh, music, um, getting back to, to music uh, discussion boards. And so I wanted to run some of them by you. Uh, the use of shields, good or bad? So the use of shields should be good at preventing the, the uh, large droplet mode of transmission because those droplets are so big, they're like a spray bottle. And when you, you know, actuate a spray bottle against something, typically it can stop a lot of the, the droplets. But they're going to be ineffective for smaller particles, particles below 10 microns, because those particles don't shoot through air very far. They have a harder time impacting unless the airflow velocity is really high, which means that they're going to just move right around the, the shield eventually into the room air and find the breathing zone of you know, other people. The idea that shields will disrupt the air currents in the room. Um, certainly the shield will disrupt any forced air current that it impacts against it. But it's not going, you know, uh, I go back to my smoker analogy, right? If you're sitting in a room and someone is facing you, say six feet away, and you've got a big shield between you, and they blow their smoke straight into the shield, it's not like you're going to see all that smoke just stick to the shield, right? It's going to hit the shield and just move away like a you know a smooth jet of air. And then where's it going to go? Well, it's going to fill up the room over time. And so if, and this is an if because we don't have perfect evidence yet, but we have likely evidence that if aerosol modes of transmission are likely and uh, of, of worth to consider, a shield is not going to protect against that. Um, shower curtains. A lot of people are putting up clear shower curtains. Same idea? Same idea. Uh, the more you obviously prevent an airflow path from one point to the other, you can lower it, but you won't be able to prevent it, especially if you have a high rate of generation. Rooms are naturally, they're, they're never still. And that's because there are people and uh, heat currents within the room. And so um, your body puts off a natural plume of air. And so although you can't see it, there's air rising up around your body all the time. And that creates a slow convection within a room that circulates air within a room. Only empty rooms that are perfectly, when all the walls are the same temperature, only then will you see you know, a perfectly still, like you, what, what, you know, when you see a calm lake. But in most rooms, you, there's a constant airflow happening. Yeah, and I will add uh, that if you do something like block off part of a room with a shower curtain, 
you also have the potential of creating a, an area of very high aerosol concentration that may then be difficult to manage. For example, when the person goes to open the door, there might be a huge plume of aerosols that's then released into the hallway. That's right. Yeah. And I think I, I do want to echo what Peter said earlier. Wearing masks right now, in my opinion, is the best thing you can do always. I, I want to get to masks. We have a lot to talk about with masks. Um, but one last thing, uh, HEPA filters, are there, are there numbers that people can think about uh, when they're considering, I, I think, you know, a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of signs are pointing to the benefits, the potential benefits of, of increasing the clean air delivery rate with a portable HEPA filter. Uh, are there numbers that people can think about um, uh, when they think about sizing their HEPA filters? Yes, um, a HEPA filter will help. Will it make you safe and risk-free? No. You know, there is no risk-free scenario indoors when you're sharing a room who, with someone who's potentially infected with COVID-19. But when you look at a HEPA filter, um, the good ones, uh, and I, and I want to make sure that I uh, say two things here. One, only buy HEPA filters with actual filters. Do not buy electronic air cleaners. They make ozone and nitrogen dioxide which are two harmful pollutants. They are not illegal because it's apparently not illegal to make ozone indoors and breathe it in, although there are rules and the Clean Air Act prevents our outdoor air from having virtually any high levels of those pollutants. So do not use electronic air cleaners, use um, you know, mechanical HEPA filters. HEPA stands for high efficiency particulate air. When you look at a HEPA filter, it should come with what's called a clean air delivery rate, C-A-D-R. And that will typically be in some sort of volume per unit time unit, like cubic meters per minute or cubic feet per hour. If you know the volume of your room, you can look at the clean air delivery rate of the filter and you can see then, if you divide one to the other, how many times per hour or per minute that filter will exchange all the air in the room. And that will then give you an idea of risk reduction. It will not allow you to calculate absolute risk because as Peter said earlier, we do not yet know what the infectious dose is of COVID-19. So we cannot tell you perfectly what is an acceptable level of risk for ventilation. Uh, I wanted to, uh, thanks very much for that. I, I wanted to uh, go ahead and share my screen again and just show people some of the work that we've been doing here in Iowa um, with the idea that uh, as we ran through our calculations with our uh, with Dr. Stanier, who's an aerosol expert here, and and uh, and others, uh, we found that the risks were higher than we expected, and so uh, we decided to study that in more detail. And I would recommend that every university that has access to a, an aerosol expert, an engineering department, chemical engineering department, get in touch with those folks, get in touch with the facilities management folks. Uh, you need to characterize very carefully uh, your ventilation systems and your spaces because they're all different uh, and they all change that risk, uh, uh, not only to the people who are in the room, but also potentially to people in the hallways, for example. So here is uh, just some of the ideas that we that we went with. And so uh, you can see on the screen here a picture of our large concert stage. We used uh, some smoke uh, and some bubblers uh, to characterize the airflow on that stage. You can see uh, on the bottom left of your screen uh, that we have a particle counter and a bubbler machine. Uh, and uh, so the idea is, is that we're looking for airflow across the stage. And it's a lot more complicated than you might think. Our next iteration is gonna be with the simulation of warm bodies on the stage because as Dr. Vulcans mentioned, uh, the warmth from the body is actually a really important part of a lot of ventilation systems. We found to our surprise that when um, you didn't have as many warm bodies on the stage as you might not because of uh, distancing from COVID, 
that that really changed the, the ideas of how much air was being delivered to the stage. Um, you can see in the upper right corner here, this is an image of one of our practice rooms. We were concerned about the possibility of aerosol generation in the practice room making it through to the hallway. And so we set up a nebulizer inside the practice room here. Uh, and you can see in the bottom right of the screen, the nebulizer uh, with some measuring devices uh, inside the practice room. And then in the top right of the screen, you can see we had uh, similar measuring devices outside the practice room. I still don't have data from any of those, but uh, that's the kind of work that we're doing and that I would recommend to everyone uh, to figure out what the specific risks are uh, in your particular situation. I think it's very important. Uh, okay, let's move on to masks. Dr. Hoffman, uh, would you be pleased if, uh, if one of your patients uh, came in with a mask with a slit in it? Uh, no, it's, it's nice to have as much of a barrier as you possibly can. And that brings up the concept of the N95s. A number of them come in with N95s with a valve in it that lets them exhale and essentially breathe better. But those are discouraged because they're perhaps protecting the wearer, but not those around the wearer. So there are some good masks and some bad masks. And unfortunately, the best N95s are pretty uncomfortable. They impair your ability to communicate and sometimes even compromise your surgery because you're asking for something and somebody with a shield and an N95 on is not gonna necessarily hear what's muffled through your voice your mask as your voice is projected. Yeah. Um, Dr. Chen Hong, so, so the recommendation has been made and a lot of places are implementing this idea of having wind instrumentalists play their instruments uh, with a mask with a slit in it. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, it's, again, it's, uh, there are other factors that uh, would m moderate that uh, scenario, which is again, duration of time, how far people are apart, whether or not you have these physical barriers. But, but again, it, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Vulcans will have some thoughts about it, but you know, the, the aperture, and I know in uh, Andrews and third surgery, there are some designs that I've seen that people have used to mitigate risk in the, in the clinic, and I, I'm curious to know what you've done with these small aperture type um, uh, uh, designs in mass. But again, you know, I think again, in terms of the big picture, sure, it definitely does mitigate risk and the other things you can think about. And it's definitely better than nothing. I would say one other concept I'd bring up in the infectious disease world is that dose of virus is actually might be an important thing because um, there's some ecologic evidence that the more, more people wear masks, even though you might get sick, uh, it's, you're getting less sick because you're delivering less virus. And we know about that concept you know, for lung and other infectious diseases. So that concept of virus load might be an important one. So if you have an aperture and you're de just decreasing the amount of virus coming from a potentially infected person, that might have a benefit in terms of, even if you get a few viral particles, you may not get serious disease. So you're, you're saying that this kind of mask could even protect the wearer to some extent? Yes, so it can protect the wearer as well as protect the person who wears it from, um, you know, throwing out viral particles. Again, like we said, we say, keep on saying it's not, and it's tough for people because we can't say you're gonna eliminate risk but you're just gonna decrease risk by multiple interventions. Right, and so this is kind of the concept that uh, even if we don't know what the risk reduction is, if you stack enough of those up together, then you might get somewhere. Right? And as Dr. Vulcan says, it's very tough for us to talk about it because we don't have numbers attached to these different yeah. interventions um, right now. Right, and so, um, what about this idea of, of so it's come up, uh, should teachers wear KN95 masks? What do you think? Um, Maybe I could, oh, go ahead. Okay, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Doc. Well, I think it's uh, somewhat uh, individualized. If you have a 70 year old obese diabetic teacher, he's gonna be at much greater risk than a 40 year old. And everybody's looking for guidelines 
And there actually are guidelines. If you go to cdc.gov, there are guidelines for opening uh, K through 12. And they um, really talk about uh, community transmission, the risk of community transmission. If there's no COVID in, you, in your community, you may actually treat things quite differently than if you're really at a substantial uncontrolled rate when you might be closing things down. So there's other factors besides just the barriers, but what's going on in your community that, and who's at risk that's gonna govern that. And I would just add one more variable that's yeah, a little bit more controversial because of one recent study, but it also depends on the age of the students. So if your students are under 10, they may have low, substantially lower risk than the students 10 and above who act more like adults in terms of uh, virus generation. Interesting question. So um, one of the things that I've uh, wondered is, uh, one of the arguments about under the age of 10 is that they're less likely to be symptomatic, that is, they're less likely to be coughing, sneezing because of this virus. If we go ahead and then put a wind instrument in front of them, uh, then they are potentially producing aerosols. And so does that negate that argument? It certainly increases the risk compared to a normal student who, because the idea is that the, one of them, not known why younger kids have less risk of acquiring as well as transmission. Some of the hypotheses are they, when they, they're lower down, so they speak and when they're, you know, they're kind of speaking to the ground most of the time. So that's where most of the stuff goes because they do get infected. Uh, we know that from studies and all over, including US. Right. And so if you put a wind instrument in front of them, all of a sudden you're giving them more superpowers, you're amplifying that potential. So I agree with Adam that it's different from a regular student in an elementary school class. Mm. And uh, Dr. Chin Hong, one, one of the things that we've talked about is testing. And Dr. Hoffman brings up the idea of the prevalence in the community as being an important uh, consideration. And what are your thoughts on testing? There are some universities that are making testing available to all students. Some are mandatory, some are not mandatory, some are focusing on winds and brass uh, and singers, some are not. What do you think about all that? I think it's one of the strategies to decrease risk. And it just depends on what each configuration of the musicians is going to be. For example, if you're going to go on a retreat, you can make a bubble of your group and then everybody will be low risk because let's just take two strategies from two uh, uh, sports leagues. So in major league baseball, what they're doing is they're testing the players every two week, two days, sorry, with saliva. They're doing 14,000 tests a week. Saliva, you know, baseball players love spitting and stuff. It's kind of interesting. Um, and it's very humane, you know, it's not like you're swabbing, uh, the, you know, up, which some people find more uncomfortable. And then what the bas and you know, uh, in basketball, what they're doing, as people know, is they keep making this bubble. So they're just keeping everyone together so there's less interaction with the outside world. In baseball, they're not uh, doing that. But as people may know, the Miami Marlins had more than 13 people infected recently. So that, you know, it depends, coming back to what Dr. Hoffman is saying, it totally depends on what's going on in the community. If you can do this sort of frequent testing, but then have people move back and forth. So my, Florida is very different from uh, some other places uh, in that regard. So those are two strategies. In the opera, what we're, people are thinking about is just doing repeated testing of some of the performers and keeping them you know, as much as possible in a bubble during a, a show or a season, even though that might be hard for people to do. So the um, CDC uses a new word that I, it's called cohorting. Yes, and that's cohort, the same yeah. bubble. So you've it got sounds your better cohort. to use cohorting, exactly. But I still like bubble and quarantine, but. Adam, can I say one more word about Of the course, case? please do. Uh, there is a, there's, you have to, when you look at an article now, you have to look at the date it was usually pre-published. Uh, if it's two months old, it's old news and probably not relevant anymore. There's a nice one from Johns Hopkins that did an analysis of a number of studies about testing. And assuming you're infected on day one and your symptoms develop on day five, it's really not until day eight, after you've had symptoms for three days, that you get the false negative rate down to 20%. So the day you're infected, day one, the false negative rate is 100%. None of them will be tested positive. As you're getting closer to the day when your symptoms occur on day five, the false negative rate on day four is still 68%. So there's a significant false negative rate that may warrant, as Peter pointed out, repeated testing over time 
to ensure that indeed that you're not in a window where your false negative rate is going to be very high. And just to be clear, that false negative rate is the rate of people who get a negative test but are not negative. They, they actually have the virus. That's great. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of questions have come up uh, uh, about this idea of, of the social contract that you could maybe have between members of a, you know, a dormitory, for example, or members of an orchestra. Um, and uh, Dr. Chin Hong, what, what has been your experience with that? You mentioned that the, uh, that the opera is thinking about those ideas. Uh, how have they approached that? So they've approached it in a tiered fashion. So, or are they thinking of, they still haven't done this yet because they still need to talk to the musicians and the performers about some of the ideas. But the ideas are that maybe for some of the groups, not everyone, um, there would be a higher level of asking them for a more um, restrictive social contract during a certain period of time of the performance. Um, maybe, for example, the vocalists can't be masked in a performance. So they would have to essentially have frequent testing and be cohorted because they could be potential emitters of risk to everyone. Whereas maybe some, uh, maybe the chorus members who could be, although chorus, or, or maybe the, I would say the string instruments, that's probably easier. They could be mass and during performance and be socially distant. So maybe the rules for social contracting wouldn't apply to them as strictly as the performers who can't be masked during the, the show, the singer, the vocalist. So, that's the way it's going. It's not like everybody necessarily has to have the same amount, but it is an interesting concept uh, for, say if you wanted to do a, a short performance, uh, maybe everyone who's in the show can decide to sort of cohabitate, rehearse during that period of time and have testing uh, uh, in the, in, during that, um, perform, uh, the duration of the show. Um. I think we have time for just one more topic, and I'm sorry to everybody if we did not get to answer your question. Uh, please do feel free to email me. My email is in the um, registration link uh, that every all of the uh, uh, participants have gotten. And so you can feel free to email me uh, with your question that we didn't get to. But I did want to address one last topic, which is the idea of school programs. And we talked a little bit about the under 10 year old versus uh, 10 to 18 year old category. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, I know you've been uh, looking at some of the, the uh, uh, school guidelines and, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, uh, how you think uh, our experiences in the hospital could inform or should inform what's being done uh, in, in school band programs, for example. But well, we really have to be the shining example at the hospital and instill confidence so people are not frightened about coming to an area where they know COVID patients are being harbored and, and treated. And indeed, the cdc.gov page um, is somewhat helpful, but it also relies heavily on uh, local administration and state. It kind of punts it away from the federal mandate into more local or regional. Uh, the, there's some um, World Health Organization suggestions that differ a little bit, but not much. And the, our, the commonality they have is being vague. The, what we want are specific guidelines so we don't have to take responsibility. And I think there are some questions about lawsuits if somebody gets sick and, and you said it was safe. So I think that's something that you have to attend to in the, in the course of opening up is uh, full disclosure and transparency. And the one thing that is constant is that things are gonna change. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point and, and probably a, a, a wonderful point to wrap up on. Um, uh, the idea that, uh, that this is all in a big state of flux and these are er early days in our research and understanding uh, of this topic. But um, I, I wanna thank so much the panelists for joining us, helping us with, with their expertise. Um, you know, we, we all have the goal of being able to uh, get back into music making uh, in person, but safely, uh, whatever that means to you and your organization. Uh, but, but I think that these are important discussions to have. 
uh, figuring out what safe means to you, what your risk tolerance is, understanding that there uh, isn't that there aren't necessarily easy uh, answers for all of this. Dr. Volkins. Yes, I um, I just wanted to to really echo that comment. I I imagine that many people listening to this broadcast are uh, frustrated and um, even angry, right? Because we don't have the answers to tell them exactly what to do. And I share that frustration and my heart goes out to you because you're being prevented to do what you love to do. And that must be um, just crushing. And, you know, what I can tell you is that um, I share that because I have kids who are going to go into school under uncertain conditions here in the next couple of weeks. We're working on the problem. Uh, we're studying the emissions. We're learning more every day. And I do think that we'll get better at this, but you have to be patient and, and please be safe uh, while you are patient. I want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that uh, in, at the end of August, August 26th and 27th, the National Academy of Science uh, will be hosting a two-day COVID workshop, virtual, online, free to attend, that's going to bring together the world experts on this topic. Uh, these are people who, who I highly respect and I think are at the forefront of understanding COVID-19. And so if you go to the National Academy of Science webpage, nas.org, you will see uh, just the first mention of that workshop. We're still in the planning phases of organizing it, but that's going to be a touch point for everyone to learn about the state of the art and what we know. And so in a month from today, we'll know much more and hopefully we'll have uh, better information to share. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to speak on behalf of IDRS and all the members, everybody that's here listening. Thank you all so much, all the panelists and Dr. Adam Schwalke, thank you for organizing this and uh, presenting this event. And uh, we also thank you for all your support with the, the society. We, you're the um, medical liaison of IDRS and uh, we really appreciate that. And thank you all for all your work and uh, yeah, we're frustrated, but we know that um, whatever happens, happens. There's not much we can do about it, really. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.